it's Jen Suzuki, and I'm in the industry. I meet some of the greatest leaders out there, dealer execs, dealers, GMs, and I'm bringing them in the studio to talk to me about what's making their business pop, what's accelerating their growth. I'm sharing my own personal strategies for your sales team, so I'm ready to get after it. Are you? Welcome back, listeners. I have a really great guest today. I'm very excited to share some time with him. You probably have heard his name all over the place for some time now because he's got this great book, and I'm going to ask him to open up about it. It's a book that's for everyone, whether you're service sales, you're an executive, you're general manager, middle-level managers. It's important to know what's going on in the industry and where we're headed, and uh, I got the guy. (laughs) He's got his finger on the pulse and can share some insights with us today. It's Steve Greenfield. He is the CEO and founder of Automotive Ventures, and this is an early stage automotive tech and mobility VC fund. This helps entrepreneurs raise growth capital and accelerate their businesses. It helps to deliver outsized returns to investors in the fund. We're seeing a lot of dealers starting to invest their money into tech, and so today we might find some good opportunities for them uh, as we uncover uh, where we're headed in the future. So uh, the book, it's called The Future of Automotive Retail, and you can get an audio you can get a regular book, you know, download all on Amazon. Anyways, welcome, Steve. Jen, thanks for having me. It's really <laughs> a thrill to be here today. Well, you've got quite a background. I think sometimes it's good for people to hear, uh, you know, your history a little bit. I know you served as True Cars Senior Vice President of Strategy and Business Development. Previously, you've been with Auto Trader as a VP of Product Management, Business Development. You were a I love this part. You oversaw a lot of the acquisitions for companies that we know and we've watched uh, get acquired. Viato, for example, Kelly Blue Book, HomeNet, uh, Vin Solutions, Dealer Science. Anything else you want to share with us? No, I mean, I'm just excited to be here. Like, I'm sure you as well. I mean, I I started, like most of us in the industry, started in automotive kind of as a fluke and I knew nothing about the industry. And it's been a good industry to me. You know, I spent 10 years at Mannheim in various roles five years at Auto Trader, a couple of years at True Car, and, and now we're investing, uh, in some cases, dealership money, dealer principals money into early stage automotive technology companies that are mm-hmm. benefiting from all these changes. So, I mean, it's like never a dull moment in this industry. I think the change is accelerating, if anything. Yes. And um, I, I'm just very appreciative. It's, it's been an industry that's been very good to me, and I, I'm glad to continue to give back. Well, I certainly appreciate the expertise and the time today. We are certainly in one of the most, if not the most, transformative time in our industry's history. And in your book, The Future of Automotive Retail, you discuss the evolving landscape of the auto, of, of the auto industry. And um, maybe you could give us a glimpse into the future of automotive and tech and what this looks like, how to survive and even thrive, given the accelerating pace of change. You might even have some insights for dealers and our teams today. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can go wherever you'd like today, but you know, I mean, whether it's electrification, which is like top of everybody's mind right now, yeah. uh, e- even with the, the, the UAW strike mm-hmm. that's on, but you know, connect, co- vehicle connectivity is finally becoming a thing where, you know, the, the, the automakers are going to build into the car's features that may or may not get activated at the point of sale or um, conversely, may get activated, and you may find 90 days later when you when you bought a car, they deactivate something like h- Wi-Fi hotspots or enhanced mm-hmm. navigation packages, and then they come back to you with a bill to say, "Hey, you know, Jen, on on that vehicle, you're going to have to pay us say 50 or 100 dollars a month if you want it." Um, so it's it's a beautiful world we're moving into because you know you're going to be able to at, at your whim activate more horsepower or more range on your car mm-hmm. literally by pushing a button on an app. Uh, but at the same time, it's going to make a lot of changes at, at the dealership, right? In, mm-hmm. in the future, um, you know, a service writer is going to have a car come in to the service uh, 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 lane, and, and you're not going to know what's been activated since the last time you saw the car. And mm-hmm. it, may, it may look and perform quite differently if that consumer's activated or deactivated certain features, right? So it, it is a, a very interesting new world that we're entering uh, w- with a lot more complexity than the past. But at the same time, with complexity provides opportunities. And for those folks who, you know, I'm sure your, your listeners among amongst them that want to stay abreast of all these changes, it gives you a competitive edge in your career. Yes. 
Yes. Well, so there's a lot of movement with EV. It's hot on everybody's mind. There's a lot of day supply sitting there in the dealerships. And some people are wondering, is this thing going to take off? And then you've got, a, you look at every single position of the manufacturers. And, you know, they've got, they've got minimal models, except Hyundai. Hyundai's got a lot. <laughs> and, and, and you look and see Toyota, you know, pump the brakes. Now they're back on. You know, you've got a lot of different uh, variables to, where people's mindsets are and uh, and who's put their foot on the gas, who's going to be in the game. Do you think we're going to lose some manufacturers along the way? Well, it's it, it, it's a good question because I do have a hypothesis that this this will some of the smaller automakers that are trying mm-hmm. to simultaneously move from internal combustion to EVs and also become these software companies mm-hmm. where you can activate you know new subscriptions and such. It's going to be too much for them in terms of a capital investment. So we may see more consolidation where yeah. we see you know more of these automakers coming together. I think it's going to be awfully hard as we're seeing for some of these like, um, and, and they've got good product, but you look at Rivian or you look at Lucid, for example, yes. a, a, su- a subscale automaker, new, newer automaker who might have a great product. It's going to be awfully hard for them ever to get profitability yeah. for, for units sold, which mm-hmm. means at some point the shareholders are, are going to get tired and they may be forced into the arms of some of the larger auto- automakers overall. So I think you may see some, uh, so, so, some, some, some get financially strained and, and some consolidation as, as a result of all this, because, you know, they're also sitting there you know, not knowing to your point, how quickly the, the U.S. consumer is ready to embrace electric. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we, we've seen very recently here GM back off mm-hmm. and say, you know, they, they were all in for EVs by 2035, 100% of the portfolio. Right. You're seeing now them back off. So, some of the new generation of Stellantis muscle, muscle cars were going to be all 100% EV. Now we're getting announcements that they're going to be ICE vehicles. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the, the consumer right now is, is of sitting at about 8%. Mm-hmm. Uh, new car sales that are EVs, and but a, a lot of these legacy automakers, you know, li- like you said, have already committed to a production line for EVs yes. coming out. So we're going to see 150 new EV models over the next couple of years, mm-hmm. and I, I think we've, we've probably already saturated demand, and mm-hmm. we're going to be in a, in a position very quickly of oversupply for EVs, mm-hmm. and then dealers are going to sit there and go, "Man, you know, the the ICE vehicles continue to sell well, but the EVs are starting to back up." Mm-hmm. And of course, we have an affordability issue that I don't foresee going away anytime soon, which, you know, poses the question too, because like this past year, I got a new car and I, I really had some high hopes. What, what did you get? Well, I ended up getting an uh, ICE vehicle. I got a Cayenne, the new one. Nice, nice. Yeah. I've been a Porsche owner for a long time. Um, nice. But, you know, the thing is, is I looked at a Rivian and I like, mm-hmm. that was actually more of a size vehicle that I needed for my family and for yeah. our lifestyle. However, in the back of my mind, I'm saying, is this car going to be around that Long. Are these people going to go under? You know, maybe they merge. I don't know. But it, it, there was a lot of uncertainty along with the price tag on that thing. I mean, that is that that is a hundred percent a luxury car. In fact, yeah. most EVs are in a luxury bracket. We're having yeah. a lot of problems between fifty and eighty k moving those cars. That a lot of these cars fall within that bracket. And then you look at China and what happened with China. You know, you Tesla goes in there, drops the prices, drop the prices here. You know, and can do that and take market share. And I think that. It's telling, in my opinion, you know, with chi- with China and, and the pickup uh, and 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 the fast pace um, that they've embraced EV. What do you think? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I think yeah, the China definitely was way ahead of the curve. Yeah, made a lot lot of investments, not only in, in the you know, battery production and the raw ingredients that go into batteries, but also mm-hmm. they're they're way ahead in terms of like EV technology. Um, I think what we've seen, for example, you know, with with a company called Geely. That mm-hmm. owns uh, Polestar and Volvo. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, they've been able to get a Chinese vehicle. The Polestars are made in China, and the Volvos are made in China. Mm-hmm. Get those into the, onto U.S. soil. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, right, is um, mm-hmm. ha- has prevented the Chinese from coming in and selling cheaper vehicles here in the U.S. But mm-hmm. I think what you're, you're going to start to see is you're going to see the, the legacy automakers are going to hedge their bets, and they'll start okay. to make minority investments in some of the Chinese automakers. Mm-hmm. which will allow them like Polestar and Volvo have done to get mm-hmm. some of these cheaper, well-made, but cheaper Chinese competitors onto U.S. soil, probably with, you know, a Stellantis logo on, on it, you know, okay. um, but it, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see. But I think it's inevitable that we're going to have more of these Chinese OEMs come onto American mm-hmm. soil. You saw recently, you know, VinFast 
is yes. now, which comes out of Vietnam, is embrace the dealer model. Yes. They, they weren't, they were going to sell direct, but now they're embracing a dealer model. So it seems. So you're, you're going to see more of these foreign automakers coming into the US. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have even more choice for the consumer, which is great, mm -hmm. but more competition mm -hmm. for, you know, um, um, mind share and you're know, carving up a, a limited market into more pie slices. Mm -hmm. Which I always tell salespeople and management, I'm always like, you know, even though you only have a couple vehicles in the lineup, you better get switched on, stay switched on, stay connected to what's evolving and what's out there because the customers are going to get savvy and they, you never know, this thing could hit, you know, in, in the drop of a dime and who knows? I mean, you want to stay on top of what's happened in the past and know where we're headed in the future. And this is going to help even sell cars in because we're not paying a, a lot of attention to EVs because there's not a lot of them out there. And um, but knowing is always half the battle. Well, listen, 10 years ago, we, we worried that the consumer would come in with more knowledge than the salesperson. Yeah. And now it's even worse because now you got to worry about electric drivetrains. Like, oh, what about these new Vietnamese cars that are coming in, et cetera? So, yeah, to your point, I mean, the, the salesperson and the service folks need to mm -hmm. be equipped with more knowledge than ever. And it's just hard to stay on top of all of this because the news cycle is changing every single week. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of major changes and advancements in auto tech right now. And I'm wondering what you foresee in the next five, 10 years. What's going to Well, short term, you know, I, I, and I've said this before, but I think that, you know, as we go into like, you know, the, the convention cycle next year and NADA mm -hmm. and in early February, I think we're going to have a lot of buzz around AI. Yeah. And I think, you know, a AI, we've heard everyone's going to have an AI product for dealers. And for those dealers listening in today, I think, you know, be a little bit cautious because it's like, you know, I think a lot of it, if you, if you poke just under the surface, there isn't a lot there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, you know, bringing AI into, if, you, if you've played around with any of these, these latest mm -hmm. AI technologies, there's, there's opportunity there to, to make, you know, uh, our, our employees, wh whether you're on the variable op side or the fix op side, to be mm -hmm. much more efficient and effective with consumer interaction and productivity, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll, I'll be interested to see, you know, which products really break through in terms mm -hmm. of NAD in the short term. Longer term, you know, I, I'm really interested in, in um, you know, dealers looking at their cost structure. Okay. And say, well, I guess I'll give you background. So I've been in, in the industry for like 25 years and, you know, almost everything, all the innovation has been on like the variable op side and mm -hmm. trying to help dealers sell additional vehicles. Mm -hmm. There's been some innovation on fixed ops, but not a not ton, yet. but almost all of the innovations are always around like, how do I get an additional customer, have them spend more, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Almost none of the innovation has been around the cost structure. And the interesting things, you know, pre-COVID, dealers would, you know, make 2% profit margin on all mm -hmm. this revenue that's coming through these different departments. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that and you were operating a dealership, you'd be like, oh, interesting. I've already got a lot of revenue. If I can take costs out of my operations, a lot of that revenue will start flowing through as profit to my bottom line. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we're, we're, we're on the cusp of seeing a lot of new innovation in the next five or 10 years, okay. helping a dealer scrutinize their costs and taking costs out of the system. And that could be vendor costs, that could be human capital costs, mm -hmm. it could be just efficiency costs. But I think that as a result, dealers are gonna be less focused on like, how do I make an additional dollar of revenue? It's gonna be much more on like, how, how do I save. pay costs out? <laughs> how do I keep some of that revenue as profit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So we're, we're, we can get, keep our eyes open at NADA show this year. There should be a lot of new emerging techs out there. Let's hope uh -huh. so. Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. uh, so your general partner uh, in, in, in automotive and mobile tech focused VC firm. And I'm wondering from that perspective, you know, you maybe you see some key trends out there. You see some areas of innovation that you're currently excited about. What would they be? Yeah, so in, in the same vein, you know, the same conversation, uh, we're really big on on process automation. And I wouldn't even call it AI. But, you know, okay. one of the companies that we invested in that's one of the more exciting companies is a company called WarCloud. Mm. And it's just it's automating warranty processing for dealers back to the OEMs. Mm -hmm. So this process typically in the past was a, a manual process. You'd have a clerk who sat there and, you know, at the end of each day would gather all the 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 the, the, the claims that would co have come in and have, you know, um, process those by pushing those off to the OEM so the dealer can get paid. And, um, you know, the War Cloud is automating all of that. So dealers get paid quicker. Mm -hmm. There are less errors made. 
and there's an audit, audit trail overall. So they save costs and they make more revenue and they get paid quicker. So it's kind of a no brainer. And, you know, if you and I went and, and I know you spent a lot of time at dealerships, but mm -hmm. if you walk around a dealership, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are, who are doing repetitive tasks in yeah. front of a D DMS or a CRM screen. Mm -hmm. And you look at those tasks. He's like, well, if you had a magic button that could automatically do that for that person, then they could be freed up to do more higher value things. Yes. And whether it's in the BDC or, you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in, this, in the service department, I mean, there's a lot of um, processes that are very manual today, even mm -hmm. paperwork. Like look at the amount of paper that's still being pushed around. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in this day and age, you'd think that all of that would get replaced with just electronic forms, but Agreed. it isn't. Mm -hmm. So title processing, et cetera, is very, very manual and very, mm -hmm. Uh, labor intensive and very paper intensive. And I think what we'll see over the next five or 10 years is a lot of innovation. So we're looking for companies that are going to help dealers, like, like I said earlier, take costs out, yeah. but also look at their processes and just make them much more efficient. And I think mm -hmm. it's going to be easier than to hire people at dealerships because mm -hmm. they're going to get more excited that there's not all these repetitive tasks that are mm -hmm. mundane mm -hmm. and also free people up to do higher value things to either help that dealer make more money or save more in, in costs. Mm. Great focal points. Um, you're right. I mean, I can think even just in the work that I do in dealerships, which is working a lot through the CRM and um, and prospecting, taking sales calls. You know, there's a lot of emails and a lot of text messages, and we're seeing some sort of automation. Yet the technology is still lacking because it doesn't exactly line up to what the customer is asking you. Right. You could really miss the mark on, on some of that. But at the end of the day, you see a lot of these technologies starting to go in there and automate responding, sending out follow-ups, you know, checking in with customers and staying connected. Yeah. Uh, yet I still think we got a long ways to go. A long ways to go, which is good because there's a lot of opportunity for any entrepreneur out there who mm -hmm. wants to look at all these inefficiencies mm -hmm. and try to create solutions for those things. Okay. Yeah. So you've got traditional automotive retailers and um, they've got to adapt and they've got to stay relevant in the face of all of these emerging technologies and, and, uh, and changing consumer preferences. So how can these guys stay current, stay relevant? Like how, how do you adapt and what kind of recommendations do you put out there? Because look, a lot of times people don't really want to look for new stuff because they're happy with the process that they're in. Doesn't matter if it's working or not, it's working. It's what we always knew and change is never easy <laughs> for anybody. Right. Got some, yeah. got some suggestions. Cause you've started to see it working in other stores. You've seen them make some big changes. We've, we've, we've done this before, you know, put in a DMS, put in a CRM, change a CRM. Yeah, I, I think that um, following people like you, um, for example, are, are probably the best way to, to filter through all of the information. Right now, there's an overwhelming amount of information out there, right? So mm -hmm. you, you could literally spend your entire workday just reading <laughs> newsletters and articles and, you know, automotive news, et cetera, mm -hmm. so, you know, and, and not be productive in your day to day. So we, we, we need to strike the right balance of staying educated and staying mm -hmm. aware of all these trends, but also having practical tools to be become more efficient in your business. So I, I think it's, um, you know, I, I'll turn the question back to you, but I think uh -huh. that, you know, following folks like you and, you know, pick, pick a few people that you really respect out in the industry that distill all of this information down into something more digestible, such as yourself, mm -hmm. and make sure that you're following those people. And that, that, that should save you having to go to the source all the time and, mm. and consume all this information. Because I know with me, I mean, the sheer volume of emails I get a day, for example, <laughs> can be overwhelming at times, right? Yeah. So you, f you find yourself reading so much content and then, you know, you, you, what's the breaking point where it's like, do I really need to be consuming all this information? But to your point, if you aren't, then you could be at a disadvantage because you might miss a big trend that's going on in the industry. Mm -hmm. And I think you're always trying to stay on top of everything, but there's so many different things happening. And I do feel that we are seeing fast growth in every angle. Uh, and, and you want to stay on top of this stuff because you don't want to get dated and you don't want to miss an opportunity. And a lot of times, you know, the dealers that I work with, they're always looking to expand. You know, I've never seen so many of my clients soak up another dealership in my life in the last three years. And, right. and I said, okay, you know, I don't know. I, it's, 
not my wheelhouse to say if an agency model is the future, is that even, is it possible? Um, but I think on these terms for them and think, okay, well, what's your, you got another, you know, what, what are you investing in? You know, and, and, and investing in tech for me, uh, even personally, uh, it, for me, that's, that's the priority. I'm always looking for something that could help me uh, have a, have have my my backup plan, have another plan, have another arm, <laughs> have another <laughs> right, right, right. Have another revenue. And go. So I'm just wanting, you know. So you might even see things that are outside of automotive, but I'm looking to spend my money, and I'm not going to acquire another dealership. Or maybe I might be worried about what it's going to entail to maintain a dealership going forward. What sort of thing? I and I know you mentioned this already. You're like look for the, look for efficient look for inefficiencies, um, and and technology, and keep your eyes open on what AI is going to be able to do as it becomes more improved. Um, but maybe you can share with us some things that if I've got, you know, I'm, I'm considering what's happening right now and, uh, and I, wanna, I wanna start investing in something, what are you suggesting to your buddies, your friends that they yep. start looking at? Yeah, so my advice would be, you know, twofold. One is invest in things you understand, which mm -hmm. sounds very much like, you know, w Warren Buffett. But you mm -hmm. know, don't, don't if you're in the automotive space, don't start investing in things like with in healthcare, right, mm -hmm. or, or or Bitcoin potentially, or whatever it might be. I mean, in, or, or unless it's applied to the an automotive use case. And I think that um, you tr try to find things that you intuitively can look at and say, does this make sense given my my, my knowledge base? And the, the beautiful thing about dealers is we, we, we I mean, everyone has a very unique deal, um, perspective. So you know you could leverage that in, into investments. And then the second thing is just a little bit on diversification because mm -hmm. I see I see folks that make one or two bets. On yeah. early stage companies, and then they're really disappointed when early stage companies those they don't make it they don't make it or or, or they fold. And the truth is, in early stage, you mm -hmm. you can expect that half the companies are going to not make it. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just very volatile. The the ones that make it can make it really really big, mm -hmm. but you you need to play a little bit of a numbers game and not put all of your eggs, so to speak, in one in one basket. So I I would say is one of the reasons that we launched an investment club. Mm -hmm. um, here about a, a year ago, and we've now had I think five five investments that were made out of that is to allow folks who want to leverage what they know. We we find automotive related technology companies, and um, then we present them to our members. And if people are interested, they can invest directly. So mm -hmm. uh, allow us to do all the due diligence to make sure that the company checks out and the investment makes sense, mm -hmm. and then and then make investments. But wh whatever it is, there's all kinds of different crowdsourcing sites now mm -hmm. and investment club sites that you can join. Mm -hmm. um, so I would encourage you to do so, but also just try to keep it close to home. Yeah. Keep it close to something that you understand that, you're that you, interested can, you can make sense of. Because otherwise you can see something with a great story, but mm -hmm. you have no way of, of, of discriminating around whether this is a good or bad idea, mm -hmm. unless it's something close to home, something near automotive. Okay. Okay. Good advice. So I got to ask you, you've got 24 companies, maybe more in your portfolio. 26 now, 26. Tw 26. Congratulations. And um, and I many guess. of these companies, you know, we've watched Emerge, uh, VinQ for, for example, got yep. my eyes on them. Good, good. And uh, yeah, right. So um, uh, for, for, from your perspective, I'm curious when you look at these companies and I'm sure there's a million zillion of them out there, you know, what, what stands out for you as a good company to look into being a part of and to partner with, what are you really looking for outside of what they're bringing to the table, their product features? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, we look at about 50 to 60 companies a month, if you can believe that. And wow. I, I would say the recurring thing are really th three things that we look look for in companies at, at an early stage. <laughs> One is the most important thing is the entrepreneur. Okay. Um, the entrepreneur, and you, you kind of know it when you see it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you're looking for somebody who's obviously smart, mm -hmm. who has some relevant experience, mm -hmm. but the most important trait is that they have this kind of grit or resiliency. Mm -hmm. that they're going to just walk through walls to make success in life, right? They, they have a vision of what they think the future could be. Mm -hmm. And then they have the, the motivation to move boulders to make, make that vision happen, right? Mm -hmm. So I think unless you find somebody who really you're like, wow, this person looks like, like almost on the verge of being crazy 
maniacal yeah. around making that vision happen, then, uh, because it's just hard. I mean, you know, you're an entrepreneur. It's just tough sometimes. Some things you try don't work. Mm -hmm. so, sometimes you get like super deflated mm -hmm. and, you know, your ego gets tied up in the success mm -hmm. of your business. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's, a, it's a lonely journey you're on. Like your loved ones can't understand why you do what, what you do. Exactly. <laughs> so, if I mean, it's not working, they think you're crazy. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Well, either way. And then if it you're successful, time. yeah, either way. And, and everything takes 10 times longer than you think it's going to be. Right. So yes. I think that, um, that, 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 um, the way that the entrepreneur is wired is the most important thing. The, the other two things we look for is a large addressable market. So okay. if you're, if you're going to go like try to like kill a dragon, make sure the dragon's really big, right? <laughs> We don't want them killing baby dragons. No offense to dragons, but you yeah. know, you you, you want to make sure that if they if they are successful, it's enough opportunity. It's a big opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Because you sometimes see great entrepreneurs, but when mm -hmm. when they're they're chasing an idea that even if they're super successful, it's going to be mm -hmm. like a small outcome. And like, why bother, right? If you're going to go after things, go after big things. Mm -hmm. And then the the last is have some sort of unique approach or what I would call the defensibility. And it doesn't even need to be something now, but you know, when I'm talking to an entrepreneur, I'm like, what's going to prevent, let's, let's talk about our industry, right? Yeah. So you, have, you, you have some usual suspects. You've got the Cox Automotives, the mm -hmm. Reynolds and Reynolds and mm -hmm. the, the CDKs mm -hmm. that have for all intents and purposes, unlimited budgets to do things. Right. So my, my question for an automotive technology um, entrepreneur would be, okay, great. So let's say a year from now you go to NADA and you're signing up dealers mm -hmm. and the, 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 the CDK Reynolds or Cox people come over to your booth and they, and they look at what you're doing. They're like, oh, that's pretty interesting. We're going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. How are you going to answer that? Like you're going to be like, no, sorry, I, I have secret sauce. Mm -hmm. I have something you cannot replicate. Mm -hmm. So and that might not be something they have now, but they need to be able to communicate to me how within two, three, four years they're going to start to build up a defensible barrier around the mm -hmm. business where mm -hmm. no matter who looks at this thing and tries to reverse engineer it, they can't, they don't have the Coca-Cola formula or whatever mm -hmm. that might be. So I think, you know, coming back to your question, if you have all three of those, you have mm -hmm. a great entrepreneur who's going to be able to think big and move boulders to get there. Mm -hmm. You have, they're going after a really big idea, a big mm -hmm. dragon to go kill. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have some way of building a defensible mode mm. around the business. It's going to prevent big, bigger companies from attacking them mm -hmm. and just reverse engineering what they're doing. Then we should have a conversation because then I'm interested in all the other stuff. You know, wh where are they? What the product is or whatever. But, you know, mm. if I can get in the first 30 minutes an understanding of those three things, mm. th then it allows me to understand like, okay, now, you know, you, you, you've you anteed up for the poker game. You're, you're ready mm -hmm. to go have a deeper dive into the company. If you can't check those three boxes, then frankly, it's like, I'm not really interested. Mm. Thank you for that. That I, I love this. I, I think it's good to, it's nice to see like, you know, from your perspective, what you look for, because we are going to see a lot of companies out there and we all are going to see our eyes on it and, and people want to invest and they want to make money. Right. right. <laughs> there's there is a formula to there this, formula. especially if you're not in the tech world. You're a dealer. You're, you know, you're you're just, you know, an average person. Like you're looking at this business saying, all right, you know, do these things in place. There's gonna be a lot of challenges for these startups. There's gonna be a lot of obstacles that they face, and you've got a big portfolio. What are some of the big challenges that you see more commonly and how do they overcome them? Yeah, so the biggest challenge is running out of cash. So I yeah. think that especially in this environment here where, you know, we've had really inflated valuations and now they've come back down to earth and it's a more, much more challenging environment for an entrepreneur to go then raise subsequent money. I think that, you know, a lot of um, 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 belt tightening has had to happen with entrepreneurs and they've had to say, look, I need to cut costs and just mm -hmm. like survive longer. I just can't be burning as much money as I was before because it's not a great environment to be raising money. So I think that, you know, the, uh, and I, I've heard this is a little cliche, but you know, the CEO's number one job is to not run out of money. <laughs> you run out of money and you're done. So it's like death yeah. and you can't pay employees and you got to wind down the company. So that, that's the most important thing overall and the biggest challenge. Um, but you know, the, the other is it's, 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 it's the pace of change going on right now. 
things are changing as we started the conversation today so quickly that it's you know it's providing all kinds of opportunities but the the the, the ball is moving very quickly and and to track the ball on the playing field mm -hmm. is becoming harder because things are progressing really quickly competition is really really fierce in every single area mm -hmm. and it's just you know you got to be on you know very smart and you got to be aggressive and you got to be on your your best game every day to continue to move that ball forward because otherwise you know you'll have competitors nipping at your heels mm. Which is always good, I suppose. Keeps us on our game. <laughs> it does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we have a lot of talk around EVs, um, autonomous driving. Uh, we see, I, actually, we see. I'm seeing a lot of autonomous driving on the road with Uber. Um, but what do you think is going to be the biggest opportunities and challenges for the auto industry as a whole? Yeah, so I think autonomous has been overblown five, 10 years ago. You know, half the cars by now were going to be fully autonomous and everyone was going to be just summoning <laughs> autonomous cars to show up and it hasn't played out. And I don't think it will play out. I mean, you see Waymo and Cruise mm -hmm. testing these specifically in San Francisco and down in, in Phoenix. But I think that um, we still got a, a long way to go before we're going to see full autonomy on, on, on the road. Um, so, which is good for, for, for dealers, frankly, people are going to continue to buy cars and own cars. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there'll, there'll be all kinds of technology within cars, which makes repairing harder and insurance premiums are going to go up and these kinds of things, mm -hmm. because the, the cars are going to be much more expensive to repair and replace. But at the same time, full, full autonomy isn't going to be a thing. I think, like you said, um, electric, I think there's going to always be an appetite for electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. I think many of the, the automakers were overly optimistic with how big a market there was going to be. I think mm -hmm. we're going to level out at my guess is somewhere around 20%, one in five mm -hmm. cars will be electric and the rest will be either hybrids and or, you know, ICE vehicles mm -hmm. um, for my lifetime anyway. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I think that, um, that the challenges are really around how things are going to progress. And like I said, I mean, one of the biggest things that's going to affect dealers like almost right away is mm -hmm. this like unbundling of the features. So mm -hmm. a lot, like we said earlier, a lot of these features are going to get built into the car. The mm -hmm. consumer at point of purchase may or may not elect to unlock the rear heated seats mm -hmm. and they're going to be in the car, but that can, that consumer may be driving around with a car that's better equipped than they've unlocked. And then they may never do it, but the, the next owner um, mm -hmm. may, 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 unlock decide, the features. may unlock the features and pay, mm -hmm. pay to unlock those features. So that, that it's to be a very interesting thing. You know, the use case I always talk about is like, you know, the poor used car appraiser, uh -huh. who's yeah. a trade in I mean, you, you take in your Cayenne. <laughs> which one's off? Well, no, the, th the problem is going to be, say, say you, you, you've got your Porsche and you go in and you've unlocked all these features and, and you get this fully equipped vehicle mm -hmm. and the appraiser is going to look at it and go, wow, this, this Cayenne's awesome. And then <laughs> you, you go home, you go home after you trade it in and you deactivate all those features because you're like, I'm not paying for them anymore. I'm going to mm. deactivate them. And then the next day when they test drive that kind, it, it performs very different, less horsepower, less range, less in-cabin experiences. So it's like, okay, so, so th then how, how does that salesperson test drive that, that, that used vehicle? And mm -hmm. how do they make sure that they're actually paying you the right amount given the content that's on that vehicle? So we're writing a brave new world here mm -hmm. where it's gonna be much more complex in terms of appraising vehicles and selling vehicles where you know effectively the, the buyer is gonna be able to toggle on or toggle off a bunch of features. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, that just really in, put my head into a spin. I'm thinking about this and uh, from two different angles, two different aspects too. I mean, there's a lot of data collection now. And in that particular scenario, an extraordinary amount of data collection and analytics. And so how do you think that impacts um, you know, the future? Yep. Yeah. Mobility, so yeah, for, from a few areas, you know, one is um, – the, the privacy concerns with vehicles. Mm -hmm. we, we invested in a company called Privacy for Cars. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed. I don't know how much when you travel around, mm -hmm. if you rent cars, but I, I rent cars. I won't mention the rental car company that I rent from. So I don't offend, but I'm always amazed when I plug in my iPhone, how many other people have synced their iPhone mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of their contact information is in the vehicle. Right. And you know, when people trade in vehicles, mm -hmm. your garage, your garage door code is in that vehicle. <laughs> And not many people think, hey, can you wipe that off? So, you know, we invest in a company called Privacy for Cars that does that. But, oh, you know, nice. this, this has become a bigger issue hmm. overall is like the amount of pri uh, private information um, that is in the car yeah. at the time of sale, you're going to want to make sure that that's wiped off the, the vehicle okay. overall. So there's that. I also think the car is going to get smarter. They're going to know 
where you drive and what yes. your preferences are, et cetera, which is going to be a, a super convenient for, convenience for you. But think about you're know, servicing a car in the future. Your, your Cayenne is going to say, hey, Jen, you're down to 10% left on your brake pads. Mm -hmm. you know? um, mm -hmm. here, here are the three closest dealerships mm -hmm. and the, the specials that are, 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 are um, they're willing to give you to come in and get your brake pads re um, fixed or, or replaced. And um, so it's going to be less around the dealer that sold you the car mm -hmm. and then following up out of their CRM. The car itself is going to present you options on the main dash. Mm -hmm. You know, right now you, I have tire pressure monitors in my vehicle. Right. I, I do not have tire wear monitors, but right. we're going to have that in the future. Sure. So you're going to see literally on a day by day basis, how much wear is left on your tires. Mm -hmm. And when it gets to a certain threshold, you're going to start getting offers on your dash to get your tires <laughs> replaced and, and it's gonna it's gonna happen very quickly here so mm -hmm. the predictive yeah. analytics around you know which key components in your car are going to fail sooner mm -hmm. coupled with the in dash experience to push to you specials um and again the dealers this could be great for dealers that stay on top of all of this mm -hmm. but for a dealer that isn't pretty technology savvy they're going to be losing out because other dealers are going to try to intercept you mm -hmm. and encourage you to go in to get your tires changed at a different dealership Hmm. Which always, you know, we're always threatened by loyalty as right. is. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. The other thing that got me thinking when you were talking is about, you know, affordability is such an issue. I deal with it every single day with salespeople. Um, and is, you know, we've had an impact on availability and what, what kind of options are out there. And we've had highs and lows, but that also impacts a lot of things on what people end up with. And, um, and I see that range uh, and some of my colleagues have stated 50 to 80 K uh, is really um, a, a pain point right now to move those cars. Mm -hmm. And I look at EV and the initiatives and the hopes and dreams, um, you know, of our government and, uh, and manufacturers even. And I say to myself, you know, will people, if we really are going to push hard on EV or any hybrid or anything for that matter, or, or, or anything else in this, in, in, uh, that's going to be impacted by rates and, and, and payments and such. I, I just wonder, do, oh, will we go to a subscription model? I've been sort of waiting for this for a long time, thinking this is going to be the best thing for me. I love to change out of my car because I'm in the winter half the year and I'm in the summer right. the other half of the year. And I would love to have two cars. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more innovation and flexibility. I call it like flexible leasing, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, probably shorter duration leases that give you more flexibility. They'll, they'll put in uh, roadside assistance and the vehicle insurance and everything will be in one predictable monthly payment. Whether we'll actually, to your point, you know, allow you to swap in and out of vehicles. <laughs> this has been try tried. It's just like, so. I think that the, the automakers that have tried this um, uh -huh. just have a, had a hard time making it affordable. You end up spending mm -hmm. so much monthly. You spend this big premium to have that flexibility to flip in and out that mm -hmm. it, it hasn't caught on yet. And I'm not super hopeful, but I do think that um, to your point of, of affordability is a big challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, especially in an environment where we're going to have, I, I believe, overproduction of a bunch of EVs. Right. I think you're going to see like a lot of incentives for EVs over yeah. the next 12 months to 18 months mm -hmm. as the automakers overproduce and then they're stuck with all this supply that's sitting on dealers lots. And, and we're going to have like really crazy um, um, great uh, uh, deals for consumers that want to buy EVs in the next year or so. Okay. Yeah. We would think that something has to change. And it's not just for EVs. I mean, it, 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 what, if you went from a 2020 to a 2023, you got a doubled payment. Right. You know, so how long can that sustain itself? Exactly right. And which is going to keep pe a lot of people in their existing cars longer because mm -hmm. they like home ownership now too. I mean, people who have a 3% mortgage do not want to sell and then mm -mm. get a 7% mortgage. So it's the same thing with car ownership right now. I think people are going to be holding their cars longer, which is great for fixed ops because yep. people are going to need to get those cars serviced. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think in terms of sales, it, it could crimp car sales because there just is a, a big affordability problem. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you, you've given us a whole lot and there's going to be a lot of entrepreneurs out here listening for our entrepreneurs looking to attract investment in the automotive and mobility technology sector. What advice would you give them in terms of positioning their company and presenting their value prop? Yeah, so it's a good question. I think coming back to the conversation around, you know, how do how would an investor look at you? 
Mm. Um, I think that, you know, they, they do look at investing in the, the right jockey, right? The right jockey that's riding the horse, right? Okay. Um, it's re very important to be very reflective and say, like, how is someone going to perceive me? I think go after big dragons, like I said, really big gotcha. ideas, okay. because they want to hear that too. And then make sure that you've re really thought around, like, how am I going to build a def defensible mode around the business? Mm. Um, in terms of the, the value prop, I mean, Especially, uh, we'll, we'll talk about you know some, something that com comes close to home, and you'll appreciate this. I mean, the number of dealers that I talk about that don't even take uh, v vendor meetings any longer, yeah, because they just get inundated, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, cold calls, um, cold emails, etc., is just really, really challenging. So, I think it's more important than ever to have proof points that your solution works. Mm -hmm. and have dealer either testimonials or references or whatever it might be. If you've got a couple of dealers that this is really working for, leverage the heck out of those things. Mm -hmm. Get get a few dealers on board in the early days that will be, be willing to give you testimonials. And I think you know, dealers pay attention when they see success for other dealers. Mm -hmm. And they just become de so desensitized to vendors just cold calling them that it's, it's really, really hard. And you know, I'm, I'm amazed. We've got, you know, a bunch of dealers now, dealer principals who are investors in our, in our two funds funds and mm -hmm. I'm amazed at the number of dealers that don't even walk the floors at at NADA any longer because they they say like look I'm, I'm just tired of getting harassed yeah well they change their badges mm -hmm. they That's change their badges if they go yeah. at if they go at all right <laughs> right yeah. there you go. The, the, the old trick is yeah borrow, borrow a vendor's badge or something so right. I can get in incognito but i think you know like listen this, this is a big problem for all the vendors that are out there like if, if the dealers have become desensitized to the pitch mm. and they, they're avoiding the floor at nada then you gotta have to be creative mm. and you know if you've got if you if you believe that you've got a truly differentiated valuable thing that you're trying to sell you just need to break through differently yeah yeah you got an idea well, I think, I think people like you, for example, right? Like, I mean, coming back to you, but I mean, if I, could, if I, if I was selling something, I, I could get on I your, you on that. Yeah. But, no, I could get on your radar, right. Mm -hmm. And get, get mm -hmm. Jen interested, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and co-op you as a thought uh, partner and say, look, mm -hmm. Jen, you talk to a lot of dealers. What's the best way to, for, for me to get in? I can tell you like, just like gorilla, gorilla, gorilla tactics that I've yeah. seen work is like, you know, all these dealers bring their best idea to their 20 groups. Right. And if you can talk to the dealers that really love you, and say, yeah. hey, look, you know, how can I convince you to bring my idea to your 20 group? Uh -huh. Because then, then you get in front of like 19 other owners. Yeah. So, I mean, creative ways of working with folks like you who are mm -hmm. in the trenches and really have your fingers on the pulse of what dealers are doing, what their needs are, mm -hmm. et cetera. And then just be really, really creative with like, how are you going to get in front of the owners? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you, that's how I've built my business. So I know that works. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but it's it's hard, right? It is hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I, you know, I always feel the dealer's pain because I'm in their stores and, you know, we're, we've been longtime friends, clients, colleagues, whatever, the whole relationship. And it's like they get 50 calls a day from vendors and they're always asking me, who, 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 who should I talk to? Do I need to know what, if they go to NADA, what are the top three companies I should look at? Because there's just so much out there. It's overwhelming. You don't know which direction to go, which, yeah. you know, I'm so grateful for the time that you shared with us today, because I think you've given us a lot of things to think about from many different perspectives. Uh, really, truly, you're a great guy for sharing uh, all of this with us today. And, and you know, with the common thread, the common goal, like, how can we help our industry survive? Right. That's a, that's a, that's a key thing. It's a great industry that's been good to both you and me. Yeah. And we, we, we owe it to help them make sure that, you know, the next generation mm -hmm. makes it and uh, we, we need to help mentor and bring up the next generation. So, no, happy to be here today, Jen. We should do this definitely more often. Thank you. And, and listen, I appreciate everything you do for, for your customers and for the industry overall. I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. I enjoy it. I love it. <laughs> If you like these episodes and my sales game techniques, you should snatch up our latest dealer education program I'm hosting. It's called Jen's Remote Classes, and it's a one-hour, once-a-week class with me alongside other dealerships all pursuing the same end game to achieve top 10% status in your dealership. For more info, hit me up. All my contact info is in the show notes. I want to hear from you. And follow Dealer Talk with Jen Suzuki right now to get notified when episodes like this one drop. This is Jen on the podcast Dealer Talk with Jen Suzuki. See ya!